Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our students online and our students here. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our teaching uh, this, this morning. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this uh, beautiful time, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, for teaching us, that leads us, that that enables us to learn, oh God. And even as we spend these two hours in your presence, I pray, God, that you will speak to our hearts, minister to us, oh God, that we will receive your word, and, Lord, that we will understand your word and apply it in our lives. We submit this time into your hands, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we completed chapter 14, sorry, chapter 15, right? The cross and prophecy. So we this class we'll get into chapter sixteen, the cross described. Right, the cross described. Now uh, we're going to pick up mainly from Isaiah chapter fifty-three. Isaiah fifty-three is one of the most classic chapters in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, uh, because it's got intricate details of of the cross written hundreds of years before the cross of Jesus Christ and it is written in such accuracy right? uh, it, it is a powerful powerful you know there's a saying you know uh, people may not believe in Jesus or people may not believe in Christianity but Christianity has the strongest evidence in terms of historical proof you get what I'm saying, right? Historical proof shows that Moses was the third in command in Egypt. And there is historical proof that he was a great leader who went and, uh, you know, over, or, you know, defeated many of the, their enemies. There's historical proof that there was a man named Daniel. There was a man named Joseph. Historical proof shows that Joseph was a second in command in Egypt. There is historical proof that Daniel was a governor in Babylon. It's all history. There's historical proof that there was a man named Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, who was raised up in his hometown, Galilee. There is historical proof that Jesus, there was a man named Jesus who died on the cross. Now, why he died, all of that is secondary, but history proves it. Right? Just like how history proves Titanic sunk into the water, same way there is history that proves that the cross happened. There is the places in the book of Acts when we look at it. Right? That's there's history. Galatia. Corinth, Ephesus, these are real places. It's not made up stories. Right? What does John say? In the book of John, he says, Whom we have touched, whom we have seen, whom we have handled. So that in John chapter 1, he's saying, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. And that God came and lived among us, and we have touched him. We have seen him in our own eyes. We have eaten with him. Don't want to say. It's history. It's proof. So let's look at the cross described. Taking some study. Let's understand from Isaiah 53. Now just a little bit about Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, he's a prophet who served under four Jewish kings. And had a ministry that lasted 50 to 70 years. Think about this. 50 to 70 years of ministry. What is he doing? He's only prophesying. Prophesying and prophesying and prophesying to the Babylonians. Prophesying about the Jewish people. Prophesying about um, uh, the, the future of uh, Israel. He's prophesying all through the book of Isaiah. Prophecies. Right? And... So this, this, this book of Isaiah is called a mini Bible. How many of you have read the whole of Isaiah? Right? Because in between, somewhere it goes. Okay, prophecy against uh, Gog and Magog. Okay, that's boring. But it's a 
It's called a mini Bible. Everything is there in that that we have to learn. Chapter 1 to 30, chapter 39, deal with the law and judgment. God is saying, okay, this is what the law is. This is what judgment is going to happen if you disobey. Chapter 40 to 66 deals with comfort, salvation, and the future glory. So both is happening here. I was just sharing. The Old Testament, it looks like God is very upset with everyone. It's not so. In the trouble, in the storm, God is saying, I have a good plan for you. I have a good hope for you. Now, all that you're going through is not my fault. You, as a nation, is, is choosing to sin against me. I cannot close my eyes and say, I'm not looking at the sin. That's not God. God has to... You know, he judges sin. What did he do on the cross? God put all his judgment upon his son on the cross. Right? There was no compassion at that time. All the judgment of God was put on, the, on Jesus Christ. It was like Jesus is saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God is just turning his face and looking the other way. It's just a picture for us to understand. Why? Because of us. Right? So, Isaiah was a prophet who served under four Jewish kings. Isaiah was a married man. His wife also was a prophetess and they had two children. Now, let's look at the authenticity. What is the meaning of authenticity? Sorry? Yeah. Authenticity means the truth. What? How do we know it's real? How do we know? Okay, Isaiah was written. How do we know it's real? Did it was it somebody who wrote something and now we are reading about it? What's the authenticity? Let's look at that. Now, Malachi was the last book in the Old Testament, written in about 400 BC. So the completion of the Old Testament was 400 BC, somewhere during the time of Ezra. Now, don't get confused, right? Remember the, the Old Testament is not in order. Job was when? During the time of Moses. During the time of Abraham. Right? So it was it's it's not in order. Okay, there are certain portions in the Old Testament which are in order, but it's all happening in, remember Jerusalem was divided into two. There's the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Judah. And Israel. Right? So there were prophets who were prophesying to Judah, the northern kingdom. Prophets are prophesying to southern kingdom. It was not like the prophets in northern kingdom were saying, first you prophesy, then I'll prophesy. So it's in order. No. So it's all jumbled up. So let's look at what, what we can see here. The oldest available copies of the Old Testament were about 980, which is 1,300 years from the completion of the of the last old testament book okay let me explain this so we understand it malachi he sat and wrote his last letter the last prophecy prophetic book in the old testament now the gap right the oldest old testament uh, it's written that the oldest available copies were books of, of the old testament were 980 which is from the time malachi was written 1300 years later Right? That was the time gap. Now, in 1947, what happened in 1947? Not Indian Independence Day. Here. In 1947, something very powerful happened. And God did this. God did this. Okay? We see, I have something called as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, you know, there are archaeologists. Right? What Their job is they'll go and start digging and searching for historical things. That's all their job is. The government will tell them, go, do what you have to do. That's all their job is. Day and night, they'll be digging up things, trying to search for things. Now, in 1947, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. What is there in the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls were the entire Old Testament, except for the Book of Esther. So. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all the entire Old Testament, except for the book of Esther, was there in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Picture that. Okay? Now, these Dead Sea Scrolls was a leather scroll, and the most important of these scrolls was the book of Isaiah, which was dated 100 to 200 BC. That means more than 2,000 years old that Dead Sea Scrolls were. Okay, can you think of that? 1947, they searched the archaeologists, they found it. What was found? They found the entire Old Testament. Only the book of Esther is not there. So in that, one of the books was Isaiah. And so what these archaeologists did was they took that Dead Sea Scrolls, which was written 2,000 years before, and they took the Bible, the Bible in 19, whatever, 1947, 1950, that's just a few years ago. And they compared it. It's word to word perfect. It doesn't mean feel anything. You don't feel anything in you. So what should I do? That means what? 2,000 years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls, what was written, Found in 1947, you put one, one is 2000 years old, one is uh, 100 years old or 50 years old. Or even if you take out your Bible now, if you, if you go to wherever they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, you take out Isaiah, you put that 2000 year old scrolls next to it and you ask that person, okay, you translate and see, it is word to word perfect. That is history. So there was a man named Isaiah and he wrote this, right? Now, what are the three? So everyone understood this, right? Right? So it's not some poetry. It's not something somebody's written. It is perfect. That's why the, the psalmist says, you know, your law is perfect. It is flawless. Nothing is wrong with it. We may have different versions. Right? Your translation, passion translation, NIV, all the versions. That's good. But it is perfect. Right? When you compare it, it's the same. The message is the same. Okay. Now, let's look at three views that we see in this book. Number one, a view that sees what Christ would accomplish on the cross as foretold by Isaiah. That's number one view. So Isaiah is writing, what, what will be accomplished in the cross? Two is a view where we as believers see what is made available for us at the cross and the third view is where we as believers see the imitation of the cross and we apply it into our life okay so just remember these three views and we'll come back to that okay let's go to the next portion here now isaiah 52 in verse 13 says behold my servant my ebed the, the Hebrew, Ebed, means my born servant, shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted, and exalted very high. And, and again, this is talking, who is a born servant? Now, let me explain this to you. For example, you're an Israelite. Okay? And I come to you and say, hey, give me some work. So this is like, we'll say, okay, I'll give you some work. What you have to do is for seven years, you have to work for me. Seven years. So whatever work I give you, you get married, have children, that's up to you. But for seven years, you have to work with me. That's like a contract. It's a bond. Now on the seventh year, this person, the servant, the bond servant has a choice. You can say, I... I don't want to work here. I, I want to go. Thank you. The master has to leave it. Or the servant can say, hey, my master was very good. Seven years he blessed me. Because of him, I, I got a good job. I, I did well. I've got a wonderful family. He has blessed me. He has not been bad to me. Even when I made mistakes, he has you know, forgiven me. So I will continue to work with him. Right? And when he continues to work, 
this bond servant is working out of willingness and gratitude. Now, this is again history. This is what used to happen. So here God is saying, Isaiah is saying, Behold my servant. Now, Jesus, that's why the in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, if not, it's not my will, but let your will be done. I will do what you tell me to do. I will trust in you. Right? His visage was marred. Isaiah 52. We'll get into Isaiah 53. Just going a little back. Isaiah 52 and verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Look at that. Isaiah is writing. Can you think of this? Through the Holy Spirit, he's writing. See, that time there was no crucifixion and all. Crucifixion was not when a... I'm sure Isaiah didn't know what is crucifixion. Right? He didn't know. He's, he writes there, by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. He wouldn't have known anything. He wouldn't have thought, okay, crucifixion. But he's writing here, he's saying, when people look at him, they will be astonished. That means they surprised. What is this? What is this? His visage, that means his appearance, was so disfigured more than a man. Okay. And his form, that was his appearance, was more than any sons of men. That means couldn't even, you know, the psalmist says, I looked down and I could see my bones. So why did why was Jesus beaten and then put on the cross? Why didn't God do it in a way that okay, take all the sins of the world, you do what you have to do, okay, arrest next morning, crucify, go crucify, finish it in three hours. It didn't happen that way. He had the Roman forty minus one, that is thirty nine lashes. He was. I hope I have that. Uh, have you seen, okay, the Romans had this thing, you know, they, they would have these birds' claws, right? You know the birds' claws? So they would, they had their own way of tree, of making these tools. What they would do is, you've seen Passion of the Christ, right? That's very similar. That's, right? So where they would, they would make these whips, and these whips would have maybe seven or eight threads, leather threads coming out. And at the end of it, they would stitch or claws, animal cl bird claws towards the end. So when they hit on the back, it would be like pulling out the skin. Right? Okay, now think about this. Can you take something, take a blade and just cut your skin out? Small blade you take and just cut your skin out. What will happen? It will bleed. First of all, we don't, we can't do it. We will not do it. But when we do it, what you'll see something, if you do it, you'll see something very pink. That's your inner layer. From that pink, if you cut some more, our blood is going to flow even more. Then slowly you keep cutting it, you'll see a bone. Yes or no? It's not like this bone is, it's there. You'll see something white, and that's your bone. But Jesus, 40 minus 1, 39 lashes on his back. Imagine those claws coming and peeling the skin out. Why did God have to do all of this? He didn't have to. Couldn't we just finish it on the cross? You know why? Isaiah wrote and said, by his stripes we are healed. Had to be done that way. So, David says, see, if he had just gone to the cross and died, like those two thieves, nothing would have happened. The two thieves had nothing. They went, they, they were crucified. They didn't have any scars and nothing. Jesus had it. He took it up. Why? Because the psalmist also said, when I look at myself, I see, the, see my bones. There was no flesh on Jesus. You know, Isaiah is saying, there was no form. His, his face is, it would have been one face and one small body that's just hanging there. 
that's all it would have been without any form his appearance but what is that next point he shall sprinkle many nations isaiah 52 he shall sprinkle verse 15 he shall sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had been had not been told them they shall see and what they have not heard they shall consider now the sprinkling it expresses the sprinkling and the uh, and the throwing of blood on the sacrificial altar expresses the atonement remember the old testament right now again isaiah is writing in terms of what he is seeing right during his time okay the messiah when he comes he will die but he will take the blood he will sprinkle it upon the nations so he's thinking of the high priest the high priest is taking the blood he's sprinkling it on the uh, on the tabernacle here jesus will sprinkle it among the nations isaiah is writing but he didn't understand how it's going to happen he didn't know jesus will die on the cross hebrews was not written that time he didn't know he could jesus will take his own blood and go into heaven and he will sprinkle it and he will make atonement for us but he's prophesying hundreds of years before jesus did you see that accuracy are you understanding right okay now let's get into isaiah 53. isaiah 53 in verse 1 who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed so again very prophetic isaiah he's this he said who will believe our report now all that i'm writing all that i'm prophesying who's going to believe this are people going to believe this that the messiah is going to come this way who's and and to whom has the lord has the arm of the lord been revealed it was it was a way you know he's trying to deliver the message to the to the to the jews to the israelites he's saying this is how it's going to be you will not believe it when you see the messiah you will not believe it and he says there who was the arm of the lord uh, been revealed he's saying people will find it hard to believe was it true was it true in jesus's time did they believe in jesus once for all yes or no did they believe in jesus now jesus said i am the messiah did everyone believe in jesus no no pastor they didn't when we look at the account we see that the disciples you know only i think only nathaniel said what did he say nathaniel said uh jesus said uh this here's an israelite in whom there is no uh blemish or uh, a righteous man and we know the story jesus tells him i saw you under the fig tree and Daniel says, now I know you are the Messiah. Again, to the disciples, he does the same thing. But the others, they wanted to stone him. Remember, we talked about it. He opened the book, the scrolls to Isaiah. He read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. What did they say? They didn't clap for him. They said, come, the nearest mountain is there. We'll throw you, we'll stone you and throw you from there. They didn't believe him. They didn't believe him till the end. They still don't believe him. They still don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, some of the Jews. And it's it's nothing to be surprised about because it's written here. Who will believe this report? How can it be that this carpenter's son will be the Messiah? No, 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 no. The Messiah will come in a white horse in power. He will come with a what a robe. And the second coming. First coming, he's come as a carpenter's son. Nobody will believe this report. That's what Isaiah is writing. Who, who will really believe what we have heard? And he's prophesying to the people. Right? Paul wrote, wrote in the gospel, uh, uh, in, in Romans 1.16, he said, this message of the cross is foolishness. Our people are not going to believe it. That's how it's going to be. That's how God had decided it. And God has sent it out, written it in the book of Isaiah already. Right? Everyone with me? Okay. Isaiah 52, 53, 2. As a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. For he, the servant, shall grow up before him. Who's the him? 
God the Father as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, meaning his splendor or magnificence. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Look at that verse. 23, 2. He shall grow up for he, that is who? The servant, the Messiah, will grow up before the Father. Remember Jesus was eight years old? What happened? He's gone up to the temple. He's preaching there. Just picture this. Can you picture this? Eight years old, my son's age. He's, he's preaching to the people and people are sitting and listening to him. What made the people sit and listen to an eight-year-old boy? The way he spoke. And people are listening to him and his, his mother and his father, his parents are saying, searching for him. Where is he? He's not there. And they come searching and finally they find him. He's teaching. What is what was Jesus' response? Mother said, Why did you do this to us? What did Jesus say for that? Don't you know? I'll be about doing my father's work. All through the Old Testament, all through Jesus' ministry, he says, My father, my father and I are one. This is what my father, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. My father has a place for you. My father will do this for me. My father, I thank you that you are you're with me. My father and I, he goes on with my father, my father. Right. Then remember Jesus is ministering and his disciples, his mother and brothers and sisters have come. Right? And the disciples come and say, your, your mom, mom is waiting outside. And your brothers also, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those who are in the kingdom of God, they are my brothers. So Jesus himself knew who he was from the Father. Right? We see here that it says, he grew up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of, there was no splendor or magnificence. Do you know one thing? If you go to a Jew, go to, if you go to uh, Israel and you talk to a Jew, a rabbi, Okay, you open Isaiah 53. They will not agree to talk to you. They don't like Isaiah 53. Or they will come up with any other idea or any other interpretation. You go to a Pharisee or a, if you go to Israel, no? catch a Pharisee or a rabbi and you talk to them. You tell them, open Isaiah 53. No. We'll talk about something else. Why? Isaiah 53 says, there's no beauty in him. Why are you waiting for somebody who is, you know, looking so wonderful and, you know, nothing. Jesus was a simple man, no beauty in him, nothing that we should desire him, but people desired him. The, the, the ones who knew him were after him, right? You see that difference, right? Philippians 2, 5 through 9 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was, who, you know, how, how many of you have heard that song, Mary, Did You Know? Right? That song is a Christmas song. But it says in that song, Mary, it's like a question to Mary. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save you? Did you know that the baby that you're carrying is the son of God? Mary, did you know that the baby that you're carrying used to walk, walk in heavens? He used to trade where angels trod. Did you know that this, this child that you will deliver will naturally, this child will deliver you? And it's, it's so powerful that God decided to come as a man. Now, Isaiah is writing this. I'm sure he's thinking, how is this going to happen? How? You know, he's, but he's writing under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Man is going to come. He's going to look very simple. He's going to be among you all, but he's the Messiah. He'll be like a dry, he, he, you know, he'll come out from a root from dry ground. No beauty that we should desire him. 
but he is the Messiah. Isaiah is writing that a dead so, man. Uh, yeah, in uh, verse 2, what does it say? Like, uh, he has no form or uh, comeliness? Yeah, no magnificence. In the sense, it's talking about natural. See, he was not of a rich family. It was not like Jesus was, you know, uh, you know, wearing some nice, uh, costly robes and very well dressed. It was normal. Just the normal attire, normal person, eating the normal food. Right? Because the problem is the Jews have a different mindset. In their understanding, they want the Messiah to come and deliver them from the Romans. Come and destroy the Romans and make their own. Okay, the Jews are in control. The Israelites, we are. That's not the picture. That's not how God wanted it. Could God have said Jesus as a from a rich family, you know, doing well, had all the money for ministry? He could have done it. Two, three servants around him. He could have done it that way. But God didn't decide to do it that way. So he spoke through Isaiah. There's no, there's no magnificence and no splendor about him. And uh, I think in one of the chapters in Isaiah, he says, he will eat curd rice. It will be so simple. Right? His food, his, his living was very simple. There's no account of Jesus being, you know, showing some high class things, uh, you know, saying, I want this, I want that. So in the natural, he was just a normal person. A dead man has no reputation to protect. And a dead man is not offended if he does not receive recognition. So it's like this. Jesus, Paul is writing, right? He's saying, who did not consider it equal to be, considered robbery to be equal with God. Jesus, did he have a reputation? Did Jesus have a reputation? In the spiritual, did he have a reputation? What was his reputation? In the spiritual, what was Jesus' reputation? Son of God? So, so he was God. But in the natural, did he have any reputation? So being the son of God, he had a reputation. But he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He could have said, okay, God, now see. I go down, I will feel hungry, I will have to go from one place. Now, Jesus did not snap his fingers and go to Galilee, snap his fingers, go to uh, Jerusalem, snap his fingers, he's in Samaria. No. Right? He was not. He was not. He couldn't be omnipresent. He had to go to places. That, that was because he was a man. And he didn't consider it robbery. He had no, he didn't say, no. The reputation, my reputation will go. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't bother him at all. Next point, what does it say? He was a man of sorrows and grief. Let's read that, Isaiah 53, 3. Go ahead, anyone can read Isaiah 53, 3. Isaiah chapter 53, 3, verse 3. He is despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrow and uh, Turned with the grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Yeah. So here it says he was despised. Look at these two words: despised and rejected. Despised means he was. You know, Jesus was treated uh, the way he was treated by the Roman soldiers, the Jewish leaders. He was mocked. He was despised. You know, the Bible says that. Uh, you know, the accounts of his, uh, before his, his torture and his crucifixion, they put a purple robe on him. They bowed down before him and said, oh, hail Messiah. And they whipped him. They pulled his beard. They spat on him and they slapped him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. That is called despise. What did the religious leaders do? They ridiculed, they despised him. Right. Now, it's not like, Jesus was despised all his life. No. Right. All his life he was okay. He was doing what he... See, many people tried to 
or despise him, but he didn't bother because it was not his time. Right? And then what is rejected? He was abandoned even by his closest disciples. Right? So the Lord Jesus became man. When he became a man, he suffered a lot of pain and sickness. Now, this pain and sickness was not there throughout his it's not like when from, from the time he was 25 years old, he was going through pain and struggle. No. When he knew the time was up, and when you know the wedding at Cana, he knew that's the time the ministry started. He knew that now I'm going to get despised, I'm going to get rejected. He knew it all the while, he knew it. Right? Uh, he became a man of sorrows. It was on the cross that he took up all the sorrows. Jesus didn't live a sorrowful life. Remember, when he's saying man of sorrows, doesn't mean all his life Jesus was suffering and in sorrow. No. If we read the scriptures, how was Jesus' ministry? He raised the dead. He, he enjoyed. He ate. He enjoyed with friends, with his disciples. He traveled. He healed the people. He did ministry. He destroyed the works of the devil, right? He, the, the blind, the deaf were healed. Those who were, uh, you know, demon possessed, they were, they were afraid of Jesus. So Jesus was not sorrowful. When he talks about sorrow, he's talking about all the pain that he took up on the cross. He became a man of sorrow for you and me so that we can be rejoicing, right? Isaiah presented this aspect of the work of the cross, a man who suffered a lot of pain and sickness. And he bore this so that we don't have to bear it. When it says Jesus became a man of sorrow, now when we go through sorrow, pain and challenges, we just have to go to the cross because he did it for us. We don't have to live in it. Just go back to the cross. Again, we bore, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. We know this verse, right? Hebrews 53, 4. Read that. Hebrews 53 and verse 4. You can read it from the notes. Hebrews 53 and verse 4. It's a very common verse that we always use. Go ahead. Anyone can read? Page 77. Sorry, not Hebrews. Isaiah 53 and verse 4. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Yes. Surely. Everyone say, surely. I ask you a question. Will you be here tomorrow? Surely I won't be there. Why? Because it's a holiday. Saturday. Surely there's no classes. You know there's no classes. No, tomorrow. How you know? Because there's a timetable. But you know, you're sure about it. No class tomorrow. So here, surely, say surely, surely he has borne. The word born here is to lift up, to carry, and to cast away. He has borne our griefs. What is griefs? The Hebrew word cho, cho, choli, which means disease and sickness. He has borne every disease, every sickness on the cross. What about cancer? Yes. What about uh what about the worst kind of disease? What about COVID-19? Yes. But COVID-19 happened in 2019. Jesus died 2019 years before. How can it be? Surely. Eh? Surely. He has borne it. The diseases during the time of Jesus, the diseases that is happening now, the diseases that will come ahead, COVID-2027, 20, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It's all born on the cross. And we don't have to ask Jesus, uh, is this included in the cross? No. He has borne all our griefs and our sorrows. Right? 
yet we have esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The word smitten means struck down. No? You know what, 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 what did God tell Moses? What did he use? What is that word he used? Smite the rock. He didn't say tap the rock. Use your stick and tap the rock and water will come. No. He said you smite the rock. Take uh, your stick and smite it and water will come out. Surely he has borne our griefs. He himself, he, he, has, he has, what does it say there? He, yet we esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. God himself put all his judgment upon Jesus. It's like God struck the sun. Said, this is it, my judgment that's going to come upon you. On the cross, Jesus tasted sin for the first time in his life. He tasted sin. He doesn't know what it is to sin. He's a holy God. He was with the Father, but here he's tasting sin. And that sin was too much for him to bear. That's why on the cross he says, My God, why have you forsaken me? I can't take this sin. You and I are one. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. But now there's this separation because of sin. See, why have you forsaken me? It had to happen that way. Jesus forgave sin and healed people of the cross. He could do it as a down payment based on what he would do on the cross. Right? He did it like a down payment. What is down payment? For example, you want to paint this place. You call the painters, the workers, they come, they look at the place. Okay, it's going to cost us this much amount. You say, okay, so when will you begin the work? You can begin the work tomorrow. So then what do they ask for? Give me the down payment. If it's 20,000, okay, give me 5,000 as a down payment. What will the down payment do? It's a guarantee. I'll go, he'll go buy the paint, keep everything ready, get the people involved, or get them ready to come and start painting. So you know at the end, this place will be painted. Why? You've given the down payment. And once the work is completed, you give the remaining amount. What Jesus did before, when Jesus was ministering to people, he did it as a down payment of what he's going to do. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. He did it as a down payment of the cross. One day I'll die on the cross. I'll resurrect again because I'm the resurrection and the life. Now, Lazarus, you come out. When the lepers came to Jesus, said, if you're willing, you heal me. Jesus said, I'm willing. Be healed. He did it as a down payment. If the, if I, if the leper had asked, how did you do this? He would have said, because I'm going to die on the cross one day. I'll take up this leprosy, everything I'm taking up on the cross. This is just a down payment. You came to me, I healed you. After the cross, whoever comes to me will be healed. Are you understanding this? Right? So, uh, Isaiah is writing this. We, it, it happened hundreds of years before. And why did he do this? Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded, pierced for our transgressions. He was, our transgressions means sins and rebellion and our iniquities, our, 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 our trespasses. He was wounded for that. He was bruised, meaning he was beat into pieces. Um, bruises always stay, yes or no? How many of you, you, you know, you see these people who meet with accidents. It was a serious accident. You'll see a nice bruise. Scrape, a long scrape on their hand or their feet. Will it go? It stays. It stays. Every time you look at it, oh, this, your children will ask you, what is that hurt there? When I was 17, I was worse than you. And I went in the bike and I fell off the bike and this is that bruise. 
So it's there for so many years, yes. Every time I look at that bruise, I remember that day. Will that person forget? It will be like a movie in his mind, a picture. So, you know, it was in this road. This is how I took the turn. When he's 80 years old also, you wake him up and say, how you got the bruise? He'll tell you. Why? Because it's there. It's a bruise. It's, the mark is there. So when Jesus, right now, in heaven, think of this. If he looks at his bruises, the nail-pierced hands, he will remember the cross. Can you think of that? Remember the cross. If he, he, he just looks at it, oh, these bruises. I remember that day where I went. In the natural, it looked like a cross. Colossians 2.15. Somebody read that. That's what Jesus did. Colossians 2.15. Every time Jesus, you know, he looks at his hands and he looks at that hole where that nail went in. He will remember this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Having disarmament, principalities, and powers, mm. he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Is there a which version is that? NKJV. Anyone has a King James version? Oh, it's okay if, if it's not there, but let me uh, illustrate that. Having disarmed every principality and power of darkness, every authority. What is disarmed? Think of this. You've got a person in the army. He comes here. One person is in the army, Indian army. He's wearing all his, his entire, you know, he's got his suit on. He's got his guns, his grenades, his uh, dagger, his belt. Everything is on. Okay? And then suddenly we decide, hey, let's, he's come here, let's disarm him. What do we do? Three or four of us come, hold him, remove his belt, remove his gun, remove all the things that he has. What has happened to him? He's disarmed now. He has nothing with him. Is he in the Indian army? Still. It's not like once it's not there, he's not in the army. He's in the army, but right now he's disarmed. He has no power. Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed every power and authority of the devil, he made a public spectacle triumphing over them on the cross. It's like Jesus is looking at his nail pierced hand and he's saying, I disarmed the devil. I destroyed the devil. It's done. I, how did I do it? Through the cross. Des I destroyed the devil. He's finished. But is he still working? Yes. But he's defeated. What a powerful work that is. Right? All right. Uh, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue from where we stopped. Right?